thanks for coming out at five o'clock on the last day of a conference. I really appreciate it. Uh, I, I'm going to take this opportunity to check in with that's okay. Everything's fine. I'm going to take this opportunity to check in a little bit with who's here and kind of where we're at. I realized I wrote this for like people who've been using open telemetry for years and or people who are starting tomorrow. So uh, just let's 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 if, if somebody's willing to raise their hand and tell me kind of where are you at with monitoring with open telemetry? Is it something you're using now? Is it something you're thinking about using? Uh, speak up. Let, 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 let us know. I'm just thinking about it. Uh, like, this is a array border sort, right? Love it. Love it. OK. Okay, anybody, anybody who's like monitoring uh, like 100 or more microservice stack with open telemetry? Any hands out of the eight people left? Yes, one. All right, well, I, I, I hope this is good for you as well. Uh, so, oh, don't do that again. So this is controlling data overhead with the open telemetry collector. Um, so sort of two possible interpretations of that uh, Topic line is this about controlling other data overhead, like the data overhead of your services. But this is largely about uh, some success stories from controlling that footprint from your observability tooling. So seeing that we have some kind of impact from observability, which is largely inevitable, um, then uh, how do you control that? There's some. Uh, yesterday I did an intro to open telemetry. I found that I wanted some more material from that as people were kind of advanced. So a little bit of that talk got pulled into this one. So apologies if you saw, if you've seen a couple of these slides before. But we'll be going through it in a new way. So who am I to be speaking to you about this? Uh, so I am now with Sigdadot, which does uh, development environmental testing on Kubernetes. Not super closely related to what we're talking about today, which is nice because I didn't have to worry if this was to product pitchy. Um, before that, with a, a telemetry hub, which works directly with Open Telemetry, and on New Relic's Open Telemetry team. Um, before that, working with closed observability tools for seven years before that with New Relic. So um, that's my experience. A, a, a lot of stuff working with enterprises trying to do like pre hotel. Uh, distributed tracing and other metrics and measurements. Um, and so pretty familiar with some of the things that can fall apart. So when I start talking about uh, data cardinality and data explosion, that's definitely stuff I've seen directly. So uh, how do we start with talking about this? So most of both the cause of and solution to our data problems with monitoring are going to start with the open telemetry collector. So. Um, Naively, you can just instrument single lines of code uh, and have them report up to a data source like to Prometheus. But in general, what you'll actually want to do is go ahead and have the collector sitting, gathering data, and then batching it out to your data source. There's a ton of really sophisticated and exciting work now happening with acting on the information that your collector has. Um, which is a really cool idea, right? Like, hey, if you're getting packets from everywhere in your stack, you did all the work to set that up, could you not do some of your orche orchestration work or some of your deployment work or do some of your measuring for, uh, for example, your canary deploys by looking at the collector? If you can, it's an interesting idea, cutting out the data store. Um, let's zoom into that picture. In my talk yesterday, too, I had these two slides, one where I'm zoomed out, one where I'm zoomed in. I do not remember why I did that. I thought that was so important when I was writing this talk. But um, so not too surprisingly, the act of going in and connecting metrics, tabulating metrics, gathering logs, and, and batching them is one of the largest places where we see overhead and we see uh, impact on our, on our performance as a result of measurement. So as a general concept, what's happening inside of the collector? We have multiple receivers, and that's a place where there's tons and tons of growth 
as far as what can be fully received within the collector. Um, and so one of the things you'll see when you look at, for example, the support list for different open telemetry libraries is to say, well, oh, our logging is just an experimental for this. Well, that's natively in that library logging, right? But of course, we have tons of logging uh, receivers for the collector. Then we have our uh, processors, and for some I've labeled the third column receivers again. Sorry, so I made this graph, so of course, of course I, I managed to grab a screenshot with a mistake in it. But uh, so then we have our uh, processors. I would generally think these are the three, the top three uses, right? We have data scrubbing, normalization, and sampling. We're going to talk about some more advanced use cases a little later, but right, uh, data scrubbing would be seeing personally identifiable information in the stream of data that we're sending, for example, in metric names very frequently, and saying, okay, I recognize that, and I want to pull that out. And then normalization, um, there's a great line from the Adobe people when they were talking uh, earlier today where they said, you know, any kind of normalization and sampling is like a touchy issue with your team. So you think, oh, well, hey, we gathered these traces, and we're just gonna send every 50th trace. And I'm like, don't worry about it, because we, we take like 10,000 of these a day. So no problem, we're gonna get uh, you know, 200 of them a day. That's great, right? But people can get uncomfortable with that. So you have to be aware that that step, while totally necessary, and while it's stuff we're gonna get into, um, is an area where people by default kind of don't wanna do it. Um, and then you have your emitters at the other end is where this stuff is going. And that part generally is gonna be pretty simple, unless again, you're doing really cool like collector side logic. I have an example of generating some alerting with like a little bit of sophistication there through like a logging pipeline, but essentially, right, the outgoing pipelines are pretty straightforward. Uh, another view of like how that might be implemented, and I think it's important to realize like the collector should not just be a data exporter, right? It's not just that its job is to gather places for uh, you know, information from a side network and send it out. We really wanna think of that as the point as where especially normalization should be happening. Um, one tip that I have, especially as teams adopt, is that you will learn all this stuff about the SDK, and you can even get kind of excited. You can be like, oh, I'm gonna go train the team on this and that and this other thing about the SDK. Do this other kind of cool normalization and calculation. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll take in these two metrics. What is the number of goods sold? And what the other one is, is the you know, individual cost. And I'll, I'll, I'll omit another, a final metric that's total cost right from the application code. Don't do that. Uh, once you're, if, you're if, if what you're doing right at the jump is going really far into logic right there at the instrumentation point, think about that stuff as happening in the collector. Because even if you and your sort of direct engineers that you're working with are really excited about doing this, as you try to get the whole team super excited about it, you're gonna have people who are not excited about this, right? Who just wanted to, uh, you know, put in working application code and do not want to worry about emitting the proper metrics. So if you put that logic on the collector side, you're in a much better position for that. So this is stuff I should, a bunch of you were here for my last presentation yesterday, so I'm actually gonna zip through this pretty quick. This is just the idea of like how you would do the most basic of instrumentation, right? You have the library available, you create both a listener for uh, a trace and, and generate those trace spans, and you create a meter and emit some metrics. What's kind of notable here are even in a basic config, you do make some decisions about batching and batch size, and you set your check interval and you set your memory limit, and that's pretty critical. So I know we can think of like, hey, if something really bad is happening, we want to maybe gather more information, or I can't think why this would be you know, over-limiting memory. You definitely want to set that limit every single time because um, a bad situation where you're generating, for example, a ton and ton of traces or a ton and ton of spans, uh, you'll still get some information with this limiter in place, and you don't want your failures to cascade. So that's, that's why that's sort of, you want to do that every single time. Uh, 
then you have this pipelining here, and we're gonna talk a little more about pipelining uh, at a later point. I'm sorry I'm not reading all this text because I'm, I'm glossing over this version of the code. We go into a little more detail about setting a uh, memory usage alert with the collector in just a little bit. So yeah, here's a more sort of realistic, actual um, full set of, don't get old everybody, it's, it's kind of stinks. There's aspects of getting old that stink. Um, so here we come to a, a, a more reasonable example of an actual uh, config for this, where we have a number of ignores that we're doing on the errors that we're generating for various reasons, either because, well, you can think of the reasons these would be happening. And um, then we also start looking for span statements where we say, hey, we don't want to include those in our distributed tracing. And then um, down in our metric statements, we're able to, oh, sorry, folks. Very, very tiny on my screen in this little speaker preview. Um, we're able to make some decisions about how we're going to do math on our metrics. So a good example of that is like a cumulative um, metric. So I don't know why, my mind always goes to these basic e-commerce stores, right? But when you say, hey, you're reporting repeatedly, like, hey, this is the price that the item was sold at, the final metric maybe is how much did we make? What was our total revenue, right? So you want to mark those metrics as cumulative. Another example you'll see really often is like, error counts you want marked as cumulative most of the time. So you'll have the situation where, you know, the only possible value for like error count on a single report on an event is one. And if you find you have a bunch of cycles where you're just reporting one over and over again, it's like, oh, you didn't mark this as cumulative. So it just keeps getting set to one instead of incrementing by one. Okay, let's talk about a situation where we want to go ahead and measure um, that we are overusing memory. Oh, sorry, I think in this example, yeah, we're, uh, we're worried that we're overusing uh, our network. So we're looking at the actual host that we're installed on and we want to emit some host metrics there to, to, to say, hey, we have a problem here because there's, for some reason we're using a ton of network pipe. This is a pretty reasonable first step, uh, a ceiling warning when we start working because there may be reasons why we have things like um, asynchronies or something that are causing a ton, a ton of network traffic that we don't expect. So we start by setting our collection interval. We configure our logging exporter because the logging is how we're going to do um, this alerting. And then we're gonna define our uh, pipelines, right? So we have a metrics pipeline right, which receives from host metrics, which is gonna tell us about our network usage and then exports out to logging. And then we're gonna look with a strict match at the metric that we care about, right? In, in this case, right, network usage. And then we're gonna need to enable the extension for host metrics and then we'll do this metrics transform. And we'll even go and create a log message that we want to create. This is so right, a collector right is not right its own SaaS. It's just a service that's running on your system. So we'll do this metrics tra transform to say, hey, when we see this, we will mark it by some and we will generate this log message. And then we'll go ahead and connect it. So um, I will share an example of this full config file, uh, well, I'll certainly put it on Twitter, but I'll try to link it off of uh, this talk once it, gets, uh, once it gets uploaded. Okay, so this was also in yesterday's talk, but I, I wanna talk about it again because this is kind of the second thing to worry about when it comes to uh, uh, overuse with our observability. So um, in this case, right, we're monitoring a front-end site and we're doing like, you know, Google Analytics style or real user monitoring style monitoring. And I think we can agree that for most use cases in an org, this information is pretty useful, right? It's like, okay, this is the path that we're at. This is how many people hit it. This is how many of them were new. This is you like marketing analytics or something where we wanna see like how successful a certain page is. Um, 
And in general, we would say that these metric names, which we have listed as page here, are pretty valuable, right? Because there's a reason why these pages might perform differently, right? They, they might be getting linked to differently, so that's one thing, but also they, they're loading different content, right? So they may well uh, you know, have different performance. Now, we can have, often without our intent, those same metrics shift to something that looks like this and getting back this metrics. Now, the one mistake I did here when I was making up this fake data is I didn't update these hits and new values, which should all be one, right? Because when we're getting these paths and they're by user ID, the values are just gonna be one and two and one and two over and over and over again. I wonder, is this, is this really a table? My, it's actually a table here. Oh, it would be so cool if it was. Oh, it is, oh, well, to be continued, I'll update that soon, but. Uh, uh, so what's happening there is this buzzword that gets passed all the way uh, around all the time, which is a transition from high cardinality to low cardinality data. And you can see it on that hits or traffic value, again, if I'd set it up exactly right, which is now there are a bunch of metric names, a whole bunch more metrics, the possibility space of their values is becoming actually much smaller, right? By user ID, there's only gonna be two, three max hits on a particular path, where here, they could be anything, right? Um, and so this is high cardinality data. We have a small number of metrics whose possible values is a large range, and here we have a large number of metrics whose possible values is very small. So there are reasons to want this metric, too. So I, I don't wanna discount that too readily. So a classic example is, hey, we have enterprise users, and well, actually we don't have enterprise users, we have enterprise user, and we really care about that enterprise user. And so how we're performing for giant name brand really matters to us. So sometimes this is important when it's one particular value, which is absolutely something you can encode even at the collector level, though maybe you're really just filtering it on the dashboard level. But most of the time you don't care about this, and What's surprising is when you go to configure to not get this garbage, you can get some pushback, right? Because it's like, well, this tells me which users we're not performing for. So that must be great, but uh, this is kind of fundamental. When we're not using like our tables and our tools the way that they're intended to, we lose a lot of their flexibility and their power. So for example, uh, normalizing and averaging across time spans isn't gonna work well with this. Right? If you have 10 million different metric names, then the fact that you can normalize each metric across a time span isn't gonna do much for you for compression. So, uh, what we wanna shift to is we wanna shift to this point of high cardinality data. I think there's even a shift here between slide one and slide three of like trying to compact it down a little further to be like, hey, these are hits basically to the doc site, and these are hits basically to the marketing blog and that kind of thing. But that's a more ideal situation. Okay, uh, stuff on distributed tracing. So the big thing that I wanna say about distributed tracing, which is again, the sort of raison d'etre for open telemetry, um, is, uh, you know, so, so the magic here, right, is that there's collector side logic which ties together spans that are happening on multiple different services that were both kicked off by the same request. Um, pretty neat stuff, but one of the dirty secrets is that very little of that data is actually viewed. So there was a great question that came in yesterday at my talk and also today at, at the Adobe talk and yesterday at Intuit, which is like, how important is the actual detail on those traces? And my thesis is like super not important. That very, very little of that data ever actually gets viewed. And a great deal of what actually matters about traces is like tying together multiple services rather than, okay, on this service, which method was being called that took so long? Um, Oh, now we're on to a fun story, um, which is, this is DoorDash getting really deep in the weeds, which I actually really love. They have a whole write-up on this. Um, I will link it from the talks. I have it like the URL there, but please don't try to type that. But I, I will share it out. So DoorDash saw these really significant increases in overhead when they were doing a certain level of distributed tracing. And it's super interesting. They discovered that the problem was related to signal batching, and I apologize, reading glasses again. 
So the issue was that when they implemented batching, that's what was causing this like massive CPU overhead. What they ended up doing was implementing multiple different concepts for batching and for queuing. Uh, this was going in and actually like modifying the collector code. And this resulted in these like massive, massive changes in performance. Um, and you can see them like compared here, they ended up trying like four different possibilities. Now, this does get you to one of the kind of fundamental things, which is there were really great talks at this conference from both Intuit and Adobe. And one of the distinctions that they drew between each other was at Intuit, you generally know what the user's path to the service is. So Intuit was able to build this tool that was just magnificent. It was like you logged in and you say you have an incident and it's like it is affecting 2,100 users in these regions and it's been affecting them for this long. Like pretty great, right? Then you scroll down and you see a stack trace, like fantastic. But right, Adobe's not able to do that for like obvious reasons. It's not able to say, okay, all users take this one path through our tooling. In both cases, and in the Storedash case, right, they are able to have people working on this stuff full time. So I, I only want to express that as that's kind of a subtlety that you just want to be aware of, is that not every solution is going to make sense to a 20, 30, 40 person developer team. And so that's why like doing some simple like collector side limiting and batching on what you're reporting is really key because what DoorDash was trying to do was trying to get these really, really deep traces sent every single time. And they were able to have a team develop, devote a little bit of time working on redoing the batching logic that was present in the collector. It's a great commit, but it is a result of trying to get this super high resolution data. Okay. So along with all that, there's this concept of baggage with open telemetry. And I want to see, when I come back next year, I want to see more baggage demonstrations uh, from everybody because the ability to pass around a request between a whole lot of services and have a consistent data format that can be read as it's going into each new service can be really powerful. It can do a lot more than just observability. So we're seeing it get used with security. We're seeing Signadot, who paid for me to be here, to use it for this kind of testing. Um, not even testing, like experimenting as a developer on a single service, um, implemented with open telemetry. So that's pretty neat. I'm hoping to see more applications to that in the near future. All right, this was quick, because it's late, folks. My gosh, it's 5 o'clock on the last day of the conference. But I'm here if you have questions. Yeah, if you, if you have anything, come up, let's talk. Uh, yeah, if you want to raise your hand and grab, or go grab the mic back there, feel free to ask questions, but uh, that's, that's what I had. Again, you can find me almost everywhere at serverless underscore mom. Thank you so much for coming out.